Uh, I'm Gottlieb Friesinger. I'm a physician and an emeritus faculty member at School Medicine. Uh, many people don't like my first name, Gottlieb. It's really quite a wonderful name, but in fact, many people call me Bud. Now, the course is entitled Living Long and Dying in America. This is a very complicated and sensitive topic, has a lot of vagaries, controversies, and many different dimensions. But it's very important to each of us as well as to society. The course has two principal portions. First, we'll discuss the fact that old age as a societal phenomenon is new. There have always been old people, but the average length of life in the United States has increased from 47 to 77 during the last century. So the demographics of how this came about, the disease changes which made it uh, possible, and how society is coping with this epidemic of old age, if you will, will be discussed. Now, there are not only philosophic shifts that our society has to consider, but also the fact that very substantial amounts of the public's money is involved in this demographic alteration. There'll be particular emphasis on the fact that old age is not a disease. Aging is a natural phenomenon, although highly variable. The heterogeneity of old age is one of its most interesting features. Now, the second portion of the course will discuss the various kinds of thought processes and instruments that we use that are related to death and dying. Living wills, palliative care, hospice care, we'll discuss those kind of things. It'll also bring to everybody's attention that uh, death is an inevitable consequence of living. Uh, there are no more than a few people in our society that have gotten to the idea that death seems to be an option, not inevitable. Now, now finally, there'll be some material, some homework to read, and uh, we'd hope, I hope, that in the last session or two, we'd have some interactive sessions about the materials we will have read that appear in the magazines and daily newspapers. Okay, how'd we do? Hello, I'm David Weintraub. I'm a professor of astronomy here at Vanderbilt, and I direct the program in the communication of science and technology. Uh, for this spring course, I'll be teaching about the age of the universe. I just published a book this January called How Old is the Universe, and that will be the subject of the course. What we will be doing first is trying to figure out why the question about the age of the universe is even worth asking, and why it's a scientific question, because it didn't always, it was not always a scientific question, but it certainly is now. We'll spend some of our time learning some very basic information about astronomy because we can't learn about the universe unless we understand how astronomers gather information to learn about the universe. So we'll spend some of our time doing that. And for the last three, four weeks of the course, we will try to understand how astronomers have pinned down the age of the universe. There are several methods that astronomers have been using, and they all come down to, they all find the same answer for the age of the universe. One of those methods involves stars known as white dwarf stars. One of those methods involves clusters of stars. And one of those methods involves the expanding universe. And at the end of the, the course, we will look at some of the very new cutting edge ideas in astronomy, dark matter, dark energy, and the accelerating universe all of which put together with what's known as the cosmic background radiation uh, leads us to another estimate of the age of the universe, which turns out to be the same but a more accurate answer than the first three methods give us. So through the six weeks, we will cover an awful lot of modern astronomy. We won't do it with any math, no calculus, no physics. This is a historical course. So we do a lot of history of astronomy. We'll 
bump into a lot of historical figures, some of whom you've probably heard of, uh, many of whom you've probably never heard of, but you should have heard of. So you'll get to meet a lot of famous people and some people who should be famous but aren't. And you'll, at the end of the course, I hope, understand exactly how astronomers have come up with the answer that the universe is about 14 billion years old. End of story. Hi, I'm Marshall Lakin. I'm professor of history here at Vanderbilt. And the course that I'll be teaching in the spring is the Americas in the Age of Revolution from 1776 to 1836. This is an effort to look at all of the Americas, and it's a common history. We all tend to be very familiar with 1776 and the American Revolution, but in fact, that's really the first salvo in about a 60-year phase in which these colonies across all of the Americas, colonies that were under the control of Spain, France, Portugal, England, all of these colonies uh, emerged in the early 18th century to the early 19th century as places that are vibrant and vital societies with their own autonomy, their own desires for autonomy. So the American Revolution in 1776 is really the beginning of this phase of rebellions against colonial authority. And what I'll be looking at here is case, a few cases from other parts of the Americas after starting the American Revolution, in particular looking at the Haitian Revolution, which we tend to overlook in the 1780s and the 1790s, the largest slave rebellion in the Americas. And then we'll look at some of the Latin American revolutions to see how they're both similar and different with what takes place in the United States. This will be primarily looking at the 1810s and the 1820s. And then we'll end with the last successful rebellion against colonial authority in the Americas. I emphasize the last successful one because there are others that are unsuccessful with Texas in 1836. So this is an effort to attempt to look at the Americas as a comparative history look at the common patterns and themes throughout all the Americas between this period of the 1770s and the 1830s. David Lawrence, I am a professor of history at Lipscomb University here in Nashville. I am now in my 25th year of teaching there. I teach history. Our department is history, politics, and philosophy. My particular field is the early European field, but I find myself teaching world civilization and a number of, of courses, Byzantine and uh, Middle East and things of that sort. I've also had an opportunity uh, to travel extensively. I just got back from a semester in Vienna, Austria. Several years ago, I introduced as a special topics class to our history students a course in lost civilizations, which actually was offered by a professor of mine many years ago at Wichita State University in Wichita, Kansas. And it was quite popular with the students, offered several, several times as a special topics. And then in the lifelong learning at Lipscomb, I uh, was asked to teach and I thought that might be uh, an interesting topic. I taught it, was asked to teach it again. Now I've been asked by uh, the Vanderbilt Lifelong Learning Program to teach it here and I'm delighted to do so. The idea of lost civilizations is to investigate a number of civilizations that have one thing in common. They've disappeared. Most of them have made some kind of contribution to civilization generally. Many of them come from we know not where, and we don't know where they went. But they left their mark. And so what we want to do is investigate what kind of a mark they left and then speculate on what might have happened to them uh, and uh, maybe where they came from. Uh, example that comes to mind would be the Etruscans. They appeared on the scene around 800 BC. We don't know from where they came, but they virtually shaped the Roman civilization. And of course, the Romans have had a tremendous influence on Western civilization. And then they disappeared. What about the Trojans? What about the Olmecs, where did they come from? Who were the first Mesoamerican civilization? What about the Ostrogoths? They were a Germanic people who built a strong kingdom in Italy and they disappeared. We have a record of a historian named Procopius who witnessed uh, their leaving and going into the Alps and they just disappeared from history. So we'll look at a number of these all over the world who have left their mark and are now lost.
Hi, I'm Bob Covington. Some of you may remember me from the earlier course I taught on detective fiction, or maybe from the film course that I collaborated with Dan Church on. This spring's course is a very different subject matter, the wonderful world of wine. Wine's been part of our social, family, and religious life for a little over 6,000 years that we're sure of. Wine is made on every continent of the globe except one, and it's consumed there as well. In 2009, the United States produced more than 700 million gallons of wine, and we're the fourth producer in the world. The other three are ahead of us by a considerable margin. So a little about the course. Session one, we'll talk about the very basics of winemaking. How the grapes are planted and harvested, some of the problems that winemakers and growers face. We'll talk a little bit about the chemistry of wine itself. Sessions two and three will be devoted to winemaking where it all began, around the Mediterranean and the Black Sea. We'll concentrate largely on Italy, Spain, and particularly France. France because its customs and traditions have so largely dictated how we think about wine in the Western world in particular. Then in sessions four and five, we'll get out to the rest of the world. We'll visit the rest of Europe, Germany and Austria. We'll, we'll visit South Africa, South America, Australia, New Zealand and even such exotic places as Montgomery County, Tennessee. Our last session will be devoted to the very important topic of how to choose and buy and store wines. In particular, we'll talk about such things as where do you get decent advice? How do you read a new restaurant's wine list? What makes you suspicious about whether your server at the restaurant really knows what he or she is talking about? Well, on these and other important issues, I'm sure you'll have some ideas as well, and we'll love to hear them. I look forward to seeing you for the wonderful world of wine. Hello, my name is Leonard Fulgerate. I'm professor of history of art at Vanderbilt University. And it's my great pleasure to offer this class on the art and politics of the 20th century. I've offered this class before in this program and had excellent results. I find teaching this program is very gratifying and I very much enjoy this level of teaching. Let me tell you a little bit about the class. We're going to investigate case studies of the relationship of art to politics in this century, but also mostly in the 20th century. And the reason I take this approach of case studies rather than a survey is it allows us to get deeper into individual topics. Now by politics, I don't just mean partisan politics, so politics of the sort that come up in political election seasons, for instance. I mean sometimes deeper, more implicit, more subtle politics that inform our everyday life and make us make decisions on how to conduct our lives and how artists process this into images. So it will get, it will range from very practical information to very conceptual considerations of what we mean by politics. Let me give you an idea of some of the topics we're going to cover. All of them come from Europe or the Americas. We're going to look at the art of the Mexican Revolution. We're going to look at the art of the Russian Revolution. We're going to look at art produced by Nazi Germany and also the art that they attacked, which they called degenerate art. We're going to look at some memorials like the Vietnam Memorial in Washington, D.C. And we're going to look at art made by feminist politics. We're also going to consider one graphic novel called Mouse. That's M-A-U-S. Some of you may have heard about it by Art Spiegelman. In order to cover as many examples of genres of art and politics as possible. So I'm looking forward to this very much. I hope that you are, and I hope to see some of you there. Thank you so much. Okay, on behalf of Mary Pat Silvera and myself, 
I want to tell you a little bit about the Great Decisions program that we're presenting in the spring. As in past years, there will be eight topics covered uh, from the 2011 Great Decisions Briefing Book, which is published by the Foreign Policy Association. Uh, so we will do uh, one of those topics each week for eight weeks. And we will have dual sessions, both on Mondays in, at St. George's Episcopal Church and on Fridays at the Heritage in Brentwood. So you can choose which one you'd like to attend if you're interested in this program. Uh, as always, this book is uh, updated uh, this year to cover the topics that are of most interest in the foreign policy arena currently. And I would like to comment about those briefly. Uh, the first week, uh, we will cover uh, the subject of Haiti and the, very, and the many challenges that country has faced uh, in recent years, mostly from natural disasters, but also from other causes. And we'll talk about what role the US can and should be playing uh, in helping Haiti to rebuild. Second week, uh, we're going to talk about American national security. And that's primarily a discussion of just where are we about 10 years after 9-11? And, and uh, what, what good things have happened, what remains to be done, and what's the state of our national security? Uh, third week uh, is a discussion about the Horn of Africa which consists of Somalia and a few other countries in that area that have come into the, uh, the news in recent years for a couple of reasons. One is because of uh, uh, genocide going on in some of those countries. Also because that's become a center of piracy on the high seas. And uh, you have heard about that, I'm sure. Uh, the following week, uh, we will once again discuss the global financial crisis, uh, which we talked about last year also. And this has evolved into a new stage uh, where uh, the world is reassessing what the proper role of government is in terms of, of economic well-being and particularly in terms of providing gainful employment to people in countries all over the world. That's not just the United States problem, that's a problem really in almost every country. Uh, the fifth week, we'll talk about Germany and its growing importance in the world scene and also within the European Union. Uh, the sixth week, is a discussion about nuclear proliferation or non-proliferation, if you wish to look at it that way. Uh, and uh, this is a problem that's been around for 60 years, uh, but it's changed in nature. Uh, the problem used to be uh, about the dispute among the major powers of the world on nuclear weapons. Now it's evolved into a lot of controversy about rogue states that uh, either have nuclear capability or are on the verge of getting it, countries like Iran and North Korea in particular. So we'll discuss all that. Uh, the seventh week is a discussion of the Caucasus region <coughs> in Asia, Central Asia, uh, most of which was originally part of the uh, Soviet Union that broke up uh, in 1991. Uh, and uh, uh, that's a subject that we tend not to hear a whole lot about in our news here in the United States. But, but uh, it's characterized today by a number of ethnic and nationalistic kinds of disputes from a group of relatively small countries, uh, which on the, for the most part are, uh, are low income areas and, and not really fully into the mainstream of the world economy. <clears throat> so the question about the Caucasus is what, what's the world going to do? What's the UN going to do? How can the US help? 
these countries meet their national aspirations and, and uh, join in the mainstream of society around the world. There's also, of course, the question of, of uh, considering that perhaps this, this region is all, not all that directly important to the United States, how much do we want to participate in helping them? And then finally, in the eighth week, uh, we'll be talking about multilateralism. And here the, the question is a broad one, that is how do the roughly 200 countries of the world uh, collaborate and work with each other either through the UN or, or by other means uh, to take on things that are truly global uh, in nature as issues. Uh, and that includes things like human rights and the sharing of natural resources, trade, global crime, uh, population pressures, and, and uh, many, many other issues, not to mention things like global warming, which is very much in the news, tends to stay there. So we'll be discussing all eight of those topics. Uh, when you receive your brochure for the uh, spring term, you'll have an opportunity to buy the, to order the briefing book as part of that. The cost of the briefing book is $18. It's very well written and uh, is, is uh, well worth doing. Uh, so we'll look forward to seeing you there. My name is Joel Harrington. I'm Associate Provost of Global Strategy at Vanderbilt. I'm also Professor of History. I've taught here for 22 years, since 1989. And I'm teaching a class this spring entitled The Figure of Jesus in Western History. And what I do in this class is start out with the historical Jesus, that is what we know about Jesus from the Gospels and other sources, and especially the Jewish context, and then we move forward through two centuries, through 2,000 years and look at Jesus in the context of different cultures and how people view Jesus, how they imagine Jesus. Uh, we talk mainly about literary sources and about uh, other and religious sources. We do some with images and actual iconography. And so what we see is we start out with a Jesus in the ancient period who's a, a Jewish Jesus, a Gentile Jesus, and move through time and see how different aspects of uh, Jesus' image are added or are enhanced throughout time, including the ascetic Jesus, the suffering Jesus on the cross, the mystical Jesus, and then we move all the way up to the present and talk about, in the, from the 18th century on, about the rational Jesus or the rationalist Jesus, sort of a hero of the Enlightenment. We go into the 19th and 20th centuries and uh, especially a particular American identity for Jesus, which I think is, is very interesting. So this is uh, essentially a survey of Western history, the history of Western Christianity, with the focus being on the person of Jesus as he was seen by others throughout time. So I'm very much looking forward to this class. I think uh, it's, it'll bring up some interesting topics for discussion. I'm uh, hoping to hear more from the students in this class about uh, which of these images resonate in their own experiences. And uh, I hope that you'll decide to take this class. Thanks.